Are we going somewhere? Hello? It's too late. You're my guest. And by the way, did I tell you I wasn't alone? Hello, Moonwalkers. This is your co-host, Melissa, and this is part two of The Escape Plan. Before the 25th of June 2009, before Michael faked his own death, rumours of Michael planning to fake his death had been around since the early 1990s. On the 29th of March 1994, the tabloid magazine called The Weekly World News published an article. It stated Michael was planning to fake his own death. Then on the 16th of June 1998, the Weekly World News magazine reprinted the same article. Despite we are told to never trust the tabloids, the tabloids have once again been one of the places that have had ties to Michael's escape plan. Just think about the tabloid article from the National Enquirer in January 2009. Starting with an article printed by well-known slanderous tabloid magazine, The National Enquirer. In their January 2009 issue, a story stating that Michael Jackson had exactly six months to live was put into their publication. Were they wrong about saying he had six months left to live? No. Being that his public passing would be exactly six months after that article. So why would the tabloid magazine, The Weekly World News, be wrong about Michael planning his death 15 years before he actually did it? Coincidence? I think not. In this scene, this features tributes to Michael's 1988 film Moonwalker. In this film, Michael has a major battle with drug lord Frank Ledeo, who kidnaps and attempts to drug a young child named Katie under Michael's care with a powerful narcotic. After Michael defeats the bad guy, he flies away, leaving the kids wondering where he had gone and if he will ever come back. Towards the end of the film, young Katie clutches a paper star wishing for Michael to return. Moments later, Michael would appear in the shadows, revealing that he is still alive. statement please that uh, Jermaine Jackson is the only and the only spokesman for the Jackson family there is no one else is authorized to make any statement on the family behalf except Jermaine Jackson with that being said I will say that Tomei is right about Jermaine Jackson being the only spokesperson for the Jackson family at that time but mainly for Michael Let's explore that while taking a look back at an interview Jermaine conducted about his brother and potentially helping him escape. During Michael's 2005 sexual abuse trial, Jermaine would try to support his brother again with a shocking plan, secretly chartering an airplane to fly Michael out of the country before the jury could render its verdict. There was a plane. It w could have been at a nearby airport. Mm -hmm. Where would it have taken Michael? We would have gone to the, to the Middle East, to Bahrain, to Saudi. They would have put you in prison for the rest of your life if they had caught you doing that. They wouldn't have caught me. This interview clip with Jermaine was from September 2011 with ABC News. He admits to the interviewer that in 2005, he would have had a secret plane available to take Michael out of the country to Bahrain before the verdict from Michael's trial could be read. So with Jermaine Jackson willing to charter a plane in 2005 
to aid Michael in a potential escape. Why would it change in 2009? Jermaine is his brother's keeper and would do whatever it had taken to help Michael out of the dangers he knew were coming. Especially with those being two specific dangers that Jermaine brought into Michael's already fragile state when it came to trusting anyone. Those two dangers came in the forms of royalty and a bogus manager both introduced to Michael by his brother Jermaine. Starting with Sheikh Abdullah bin Hamid Al Khalifa and his connection to Michael. Michael and Sheikh Khalifa would come into contact through Jermaine. Jermaine and Sheikh Khalifa would meet back in the late 1980s while he was in Bahrain on a spiritual cleanse to convert to Islam. They became very good friends during that visit and remained good enough friends for Jermaine to introduce to his brother Michael, which in turn they had become good friends as well. In June 2005, after Michael's ultimate victory in that long fight to protect his innocence, he would pack up and move to Bahrain. During that time, Sheikh Khalifa would loan Michael 2.2 million pounds, which is the equivalent to 2.4 million US dollars, which helped pay Michael's legal fees here in the US, alongside the move to Bahrain. Also, Sheikh Khalifa would assist Michael with many business endeavors, including assisting Michael in the attempt to record a tribute song for the victims of Hurricane Katrina that would never be released. Michael would live in Bahrain from June 2005 to July 2006. This is when he would distance himself from Sheikh Khalifa and several all business ties which led to a lawsuit in London High Court of which was settled for 8 million US dollars. Michael would then move to Ireland for a short time period, then back home to Los Angeles. This resulted in him never returning to Neverland and now calling 100 North Carrollwood Drive home. Enter Dr. Tome R. Tome, a longtime friend of Jermaine's who tried to take over every aspect of Michael's life after he would take over the role of Michael's finance manager to end up being the full fledged manager of everything that Michael conducted. He had taken over Michael's complete life. He had taken over. June Gatlin was Michael's spiritual advisor. Michael was deathly afraid of him. That's an excellent word, deathly afraid. What was Michael afraid of? He was afraid of who this man is, afraid of whatever this man may or be capable of doing. He would make virtually all decisions for Michael, deciding to and where Michael could go, whether Michael could see his own family members, forging Michael's signature on documents and checks for shady business practices. Michael feared Tomei as he didn't know what he was capable of. This is something he shared with his spiritual advisor, June Gatlin. Last time we spoke, you told me to check on uh, Dr. Tomei, and I did a complete checking. This guy, he just... She just has ways about him that looks like he's, I mean, see what he's done, he's different divide between me and my representatives, and I don't talk to my lawyer, my accountants, I talk to him and he talks to them. That's not good. I know it's not good, I don't like it, and um, I want to get uh, somebody in there with him um, that I know and trust. I, mean, I don't know what's in my accounts, I don't know. Oh, that's not good, Michael. I know that's not good. You cannot allow somebody to just... Be in total control of, of, of your life. I totally agree with that. That's why I'm calling you. Michael knew something wasn't right with him, and he did some digging. First off, Dr. Tomei R. Tomei is not an actual doctor of any kind. Tomei claimed to be a consulate to the nation of Senegal when in turn, it will be discovered that no one there has heard of him when questioned. Also, 
Tomei would have no clients under his belt as a manager, Michael would be his first client. It's like he popped up out of thin air. Between the years of 2003 to 2009, Michael would never mentally recover after all that he experienced between the arrest, the trial, and losing almost every dollar spent in legal fees. This also includes the $8 million he had to pay out to Sheik Khalifa, as well as the money lost behind Tomei and his monetary scamming. Michael eventually would fire Tomei, but he wouldn't go away. He would still conduct business under Michael's name the same way Yolanda Saldivar did to Latin pop star Selena just before she savagely murdered her. Tomei was acting the same way Yolanda did, like an obsessed fan who couldn't take rejection or no for an answer. These two men, Tomei and Sheikh Khalifa, are both people that Jermaine would bring into Michael's life that resulted in bad blood between Michael and the Sheikh over loans and incomplete music while Jermaine bringing Tomei into Michael's life resulted in Michael being verbally and mentally controlled while also being scammed. With all that Michael has been through, not just including the dangers that he faced from Tomei and Sheikh Khalifa, but everything that he faced from 1993 to 2009, he, like anyone else, would reach a breaking point, the point of no return where his escape plan that was a rumor back in the early 1990s will become a reality on June 25th, 2009. This brings us back to his brother Jermaine as the official spokesperson at the time for Michael and the Jackson family. Jermaine being Michael's brother, as my co-host Melissa said towards the beginning of this video, So with Jermaine Jackson willing to charter a plane in 2005 to aid Michael in a potential escape, why would it change in 2009? Jermaine is his brother's keeper and would do whatever it had taken to help Michael out of the dangers he knew were coming. Jermaine would secure a charter plane through Mexicana Airlines as they would prep to close their doors forever the following year in 2010 due to a bankruptcy. This is another part of Michael's escape plan, and only the beginning of the story of how Michael actually made this death hoax happen. I want to thank my co-host Melissa for lending her voice to this project, and a big thank you to all the moonwalkers who tuned into this video. Please continue to like, subscribe, and comment on these videos, and I will see you next time for the escape plan part 3.